Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to this uh, Quantum Encounter seminar at HES. And uh, today uh, we are very happy to welcome Peter Holtzworth. Uh, so Peter, Peter is, a, is a condensed matter physicist. Uh, he's a theoretician, but he's uh, also involved with experiments. And um, Peter got his PhD in Oxford in 1985. And he's a professor of physics at uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure in Lyon. And uh, over the course of his long career, he worked on a great many things, on magnetism, in particular in frustrated systems, and on critical phenomena, both in and out of equilibrium, on analogies between uh, critical phenomena in magnets and in turbulence, and many other things. And uh, in uh, recent years, he's been particularly interested in uh, the subject of spin ice and its analogies with uh, electromagnetism. So, uh, and that's, uh, I guess, what he's going to tell us about today. So please, Peter, I'm very happy to have you. So it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so. As you said, over many years, I've been working on these uh, condensed matter systems that show uh, uh, this emergent behavior so that this complex frustrated magnetic system can, to an excellent degree, be written in terms of uh, simple notions from field theory, from lattice field theory, from uh, uh, the physics of Coulomb interactions. Uh, both in the classical uh, regime and uh, in the quantum regime. So this is what I wanted to tell you about today. So here's my, my program. I, I hope that this is relevant for this audience. I wanted to start with a, a prologue that reminds us about both field theoretic and Coulomb representations of uh, charged systems, and then tell you something about, uh, about this uh, condensed matter system magnetic um, with its magnetically charged quasi particles that have been called magnetic monopoles. So um, I don't know if anybody in the audience works on real monopoles or if this is going to uh, uh, be uh, uh, divisive or this, uh, there's going to be uh, some, some discussion about uh, the, 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 um, the, the, the legit legitimacy of calling these objects magnetic monopoles. I would be interested to have some feedback. And then, um, so then uh, there's several points I want to talk about energetics and perhaps the most interesting point for a theoretical uh, um, audience is the description of the magnetic correlations in terms of emergent uh, uh, correlations in an emergent field and some notions of fractionalization of the magnetic moments that appears. And then uh, some, uh, some uh, analogs of Dirac strings in these, in, these, in these systems. And finally, a discussion of work slightly outside my own field of research, but there's been much research on quantum equivalence and emergent quantum electrodynamics at the end. Okay, so please don't hesitate to ask questions. Um, I'll try and... Uh, I'll try and remain pedagogical, and if I burn up too much time, I'll jump a few chapters. So before going on, there are many people. I'm going to try and talk about work that's been uh, that I've been doing over several years. So there are many people involved. On the left, there's my colleagues, and on the right, uh, there's some uh, students. Uh, maybe I won't go through this entire list, but I should really uh, maybe underline the role uh, played by Ludovic Jobert in, uh, in Bordeaux that used to be on the right, but now is on the left. And, uh, and Stephen Bramwell and Roderick Mosner from uh, University College and from Dresden. And in green, I've uh, highlighted Flavien and Geoffroy, who are uh, uh, actual students at the moment. And uh, maybe I'll say a few words on what they're doing towards the end of the seminar. Okay, so um, let me just start with this uh, gentle reminder. So here's an electrostatic problem with uh, two charges, uh, a neutral system, a positive charge and a negative charge. And uh, there are two equivalent ways of discussing this, uh, this, this problem. So if you do, if you come to condensed matter physics or physical chemistry, most probably you'll discuss, discuss 
uh, Coulomb interactions between charged particles or, or quasi particles. But if you have a more uh, uh, theoretical background, then you might be uh, used to a more field theoretic description where you have an energy of the fields that's the integral of the square of the electric field integrated over. Uh, the material, together with the constraints of Gauss's law that tell you where the singularities in the field are that represent the charges. Okay, so th these two uh, points of view are connected because uh, this field energy contains both the energy of correlations of interactions, but it also includes the, the self energy, the electric field that's required to build up those charges independently of their neighbors. Okay, and so the Coulomb interaction is actually the difference between the total energy and the sum of the self energy. So the sum of the electric fields that would be created if individually one after the other, you ignored the interactions, but you just summed up uh, the energy scale. And if for a neutral uh, system, the Coulomb energy is often negative, it's because the total field energy in a correlated system, uh, the, the total energy uh, density of fields is reduced because of uh, the correlations in the system. Okay, and so, um, uh, in this field theoretic uh, representation, then you have Gauss's law and, uh, and um, the electrostatic and electrostatic problem uh, is usually solved by um, taking the, 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 the simplest solution, which identifies E as the gradient of a scalar potential. And, uh, and uh, um, the electrostatic problem is usually given by uh, uh, an electric field from a scalar potential only. But of course, this is just one of an infinite number of possible uh, solutions, as you can add to this any electric field that's the cool, that's the, the curl of a vector potential, so diver divergence zero. And uh, so the total energy has both a, a part uh, that, that's the, from which the, field, the charge is, co is constructed and a circulating part uh, with no uh, divergences. And the electrostatic case would correspond to a minimum of this rotational part. And of course, then you get electrodynamics if you include a rotational part that is uh, coupled to the vector potential of, the, of, of a conjugate uh, uh, magnetic field. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, um, two problems that's, that deviate away, two, two uh, 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 sets of work that deviate away from this electrostatic minimum. First one that I could recommend to you that I found extremely interesting. If you, if you consider uh, an electrostatic problem, but you allow yourself the luxury of an arbitrary uh, uh, um, divergence-free field, then it's very easy, trivial, to find a, a local solution of Gauss's law. And uh, so if you have a system where there's no electrodynamic coupling and you allow yourself this extra term, you can locally solve Gauss's law. And then afterwards, you find that the partition function that deals with the charges and the auxiliary field, they cancel. And this kind of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of, of uh, starting point allows you to address a Coulomb problem with only short range interactions. Of course, then the price that you pay for that is having to deal with two fields, both the field you're interested in and a Gaussian auxiliary field. But it gives you uh, the luxury of having short range interactions. And this can be read, you can read about this in this paper by Magson Rossetto from 2002. Okay, and related but not quite the same as that is the problem that I'm going to try and talk about today is classical spin ice in which you have a, a situation where the energy of magnetic quasi particles comes from a longitudinal part comes from a part that comes from a scalar potential. Uh, but there is a, a, a rotational part that's present that doesn't contribute to the energy. So there's a large uh, feel element of this divergence free that contributes zero to the energy. And this will be, the, this will be spin ice. And that's essentially it, except that the problematic is magnetic rather than electric. So everywhere there's an electric field, there'll be a, a magnetic field. 
Okay, so let me try and talk uh, about uh, such a system. So such a system emerges from so-called spin ice materials. And generically, the, the two generic materials that are much discussed are homium and dysposium titanate. So this is a rather an exotic material. Homium is a rare earth. Homium and titanate, titanium are rare earth uh, materials. Homium and dysprosium have a large magnetic moment. Uh, made up of orbital and spin components, 10 Bohr magnetons uh, per spin. And these magnetic moments are localized and they sit on the apexes of corner sharing tetrahedra, the so-called pyroclore uh, lattice. And these magnetic moments are discrete objects. To an excellent approximation, they can point either out of the tetrahedron or into the tetrahedron. And these were discovered more, uh, almost 25 years ago by uh, Bramwell and Harris and uh, collaborators. So this is the first point, is that you have discrete degrees of freedom, which will renormalize at larger length scales to give you emergent fields that look like, look as if they have continuous uh, degrees of freedom of an electrost electrostatic or a magnetostatic uh, uh, field. And the power... The, the pyroclore lattice, then it's corner sharing. The centers of the tetrahedra, this kind of dual lattice, the center of the tetrahedron forms uh, a diamond lattice, which is bipartite, can, itself can be split into two uh, sub lattices, A and B. So okay, is and, a, uh, Peter, is this a, an anti there's an antiferric magnetic interaction? Uh, um, which leads actually, to the actually, it's, it's a it's a frustrated ferromagnet. Ferromagnet, yeah. Okay, so it's fr frustrated in the sense that uh, the the predominant effective coupling is ferromagnetic, so the spins would like to be parallel, but there are immensely strong crystal fields which make them point along these local di directions. So they can't all uh, map. They can't, they can't line parallel. So the best they can do, this is the ferromagnetic best they can do, pointing in or out with ferromagnetic coupling. But actually, that all that maps onto an effective uh, antiferromagnetic system. You can define an, an equivalent antiferromagnetic system with antiferromagnetic coupling of icing spins up and down on a tetrahedron. And two in, two out would correspond to two up, two down of the effective spins. And that antiferromagnet it was invented by, uh, by Anderson in the 1950s uh, to, uh, to, to discuss uh, the ice problem, actually. So um, these spin ice materials, they're called ice materials because the phase space of icing configurations, either spin in or spin out, maps exactly onto the phase space of uh, um, protons in uh, water molecules in an ice crystal. Okay, so so if you place a water, an oxygen ion in the center of each tetrahedron, the two in, two out would correspond to two protons close and two protons far away. This is exactly the configuration of water in the cubic phase of ice. And um, uh, this physics was explored extensively in the 1930s uh, by uh, Gauke and Stout and Pauling. Pa uh, Gauke and Stout won the Nobel Prize for their experiments on water, where uh, they measured the configurational entropy through, they measured the specific heat and calculated the, the configurational entropy. And they find that you never at any temperature regain the configurational entropy of proton ordering at low temperature. It's missing entropy, okay? And this is this famous Pauling entropy of proton disorder. And the icing spins share the same phase space. So if you do this Galkin stout experiment, this is a real experimental data, data from dysposium titanate. There's no ordering phase transition, and uh, there's a kind of a Schottky peak and if you integrate uh, C over T underneath this curve, rather than getting R log two, as you might expect for icing degrees of freedom, you get R log two minus exactly this Pauling uh, entropy. So there's no, there's no phase transition in any field. And also I should say that this ice physics 
um, this was uh, um, one of the motivating elements of much of the work on vertex models from the Baxter School of uh, exactly solvable models in the 60s and 70s. So much of what I'm going to say actually has some connection with vertex models on a diamond lattice. Okay, and so let me talk about uh, uh, some of these models now. So I want to talk about two specific models that are very close, but, uh, but, but, but different even so. So the first is a nearest neighbor model. So this is exactly Slava's question. So you have an effective nearest neighbor coupling, J effective, with a, with, with a coupling between uh, uh, spins and it's ferromagnetic. And now this, on each tetrahedron, the minimum of energy is two spins in and two spins out. When you tile this on the pyroclore lattice, you can identify loops of spins that can be turned. So if I flip all the spins in this loop, I reestablish, I go from one uh, I state with two in two out to another I state with two in two out. So it's a loop model. It's essentially a loop model. And by construction, these loops are exactly degenerate. So this model, it violates the third law of thermodynamics and it has at its exact uh, ground state entropy, as its ground state entropy, uh, this uh, Powling entropy. Now this model, it describes spin ice at the 80% level, okay? Mm -hmm. in, in order to go from 80 to 97%, then you have to add dipolar interactions to it because this exchange coupling, this is the order one Kelvin, and the dipole interactions for objects of 10 Bohr magnetons, it's also of about 10 Kelvin. And this would be the strong crystal fields that make the, the objects icing-like along these. So this model uh, uh, gives remarkably good numerical uh, comparison between dysposium and homium titanate and, uh, and, uh, um, and, and simulations. And also it has a remarkable property that it has very important long range interactions. But when you put the tiled system in one of the uh, uh, Pauling states with two in two out everywhere, the long range part of the interaction is almost screened. It's not perfectly screened, but it's almost screened. So what happens is if this nearest neighbor model is exactly degenerate among the Pauling state, this dipolar model has a very small band of states. So if these energy scales are, are, are two Kelvin, then the band of states is 150 millikelvin. So in, to, a large, to an excellent approximation, you can forget it. And you can presume that this model okay, also has a degenerate uh, set of, of states. Yeah. Okay, and so... Uh, uh, sorry, were there a question? Question? No. Okay, and so uh, uh, this brings me immediately to this mapping to uh, this magnetostatic uh, problem because uh, anybody wearing glasses should maybe take their glasses off. And uh, then you can see that this two in, two out configuration, it's a local constraint. And if you imagine these as lattice field elements, okay, then you can write this local constraint as a lattice constraint of, uh, of the, in, a, in a style divergence of M equal to zero. Okay, so it's like a loose paramagnetic system, but with a local constraint that everywhere the divergence of this emergent field is equal to zero, okay? So it's like the, the field of magnetic moments in its low energy state, you can write it, you can write these magnetic moments as sitting on the back of the curl of a vector potential. And so it looked like the magnetic moments are lattice field elements with uh, diver that are divergence free. Okay. Can I ask a question, and, Peter? Yes, please. So, so this constraint, uh, the divergence is zero, it would naively also allow one in three out. 
So is this some... some uh, well, no, uh, that's a very good question, but you have to ask it again in 15 minutes. Okay. One in three out, you know, even 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 at, I, at IHES, I believe that three minus one is not zero, right? So so um, that's, a, that's a state that will bring a topological defect, a magnetic monopole, okay? Yeah, so, yeah no, no, sorry, so, sorry. I, I was I was saying something really stupid. So, so no, but no, it. it's an excellent <laughs> question. It's a, it's a, it's an excellent question that will come back to bite you. Okay. 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 So, so this is the statement that this configuration of states that has no long range order, it will have magnetic correlations that look like this emergent field. Okay, and these magnetic correlations that look like it's emergent field, this is what they look like. This is uh, pinch, so called pinch point uh, neutron scattering maps in reciprocal space. So, this is a neutron scattering map from a single crystal of homium titanate. And this divergence m equals zero corresponds in reciprocal space to, to q scale uh, uh, m of q is equal to zero. Okay. So Q here, it's not a real momentum, it's a lattice momentum. So that has, uh, uh, that, that, um, has uh, repetitions over a Brewon zone. And so when you combine the lattice, the tran discrete translational symmetry with the neutron scattering constraints, this divergence M equals zero corresponds to this rather elegant pattern with these sharp pinch points. And these sharp pinch points that give you the sign of the, uh, an indication of this divergence zero. Okay, so maybe this mapping to um, uh, an emergent field, it can be made more clear if you make a further abstraction. So I'm going to allow myself the luxury of defining a third model. So instead of having point dipoles on the corners of the tetrahedron, I'm going to extend the point dipoles as needles or dumbbells. Okay, so these infinitely thin needles, they carry a dumbbell of, of north and south poles. And the dumbbells of north and south poles, they meet at the centers of the tetrahedra. Okay, so then there's a, there's a thorny problem of a, of a divergent self-energy where these objects meet here, but that shouldn't be any problem uh, in, for this community. But, uh, so apart from that, I think you'll be able to see that by construction, then that any configuration with two spins in and two spins out will be magnetically neutral because there'll be bl two blue dots and two red dots. And also that all configurations with two spins in and two spins out will be isoenergetic. Okay, so this small band of, 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 uh, of energy that opens up when you include the dipole interactions. Okay, this, come, this is essentially the difference between having point dipoles and having needles extended to the centers of the tetrahedra. Okay, so now instead of having two in and two out, I take three in and one out. Okay, so this is Slava's question. Okay, so there's a net charge of two blue dots uh, here, and there's a net charge of two red uh, dots here. And so these tetrahedra are carrying a uh, magnetic charge. Okay, so this is, this, is, this is a topological defect in this emergent field. And, uh, and uh, as it's a magnetic problem, um, it looks extremely like um, a magnetic monopole. It's classical, but apart from that, it shares many of the, I, many of, uh, the properties of Dirac's uh, 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 monopoles, as I'll try and show as we go on. And then if you uh, uh, go to all in or all out, so there's four blue dots here, of four red dots, this is like a double mo a double uh, monopole. Okay, so this is so th then this is a mapping from this dipolar spin ice model to the dumbbell model, and from now on, everything that I talk about will be related to the dumbbell model. Okay, and you can see that if you go 
from a two in two out configuration to a three in one out configuration, you change the magnetic configuration delta M by two M. And I should say that small M is the magnetic moment of the dipole or of the, the needle. And uh, I flip this dumbbell through a distance A, where so A is the distance between the, the diamond uh, site uh, centers. Okay, and so uh, this monopole, it carries a charge of plus or minus 2M over A. And this double monopole carries a charge of 4M over A. And this has the right units because this is the dipole divided by a length. So this is the magnetic charge, okay? And now there's another important point for spin ice uh, physics here that maybe for as far as in emergencies uh, goes, it's a complication, but a very important point for spin ice because you have underlying dipole interactions, okay? These are real magnetic moments. Okay, so this is real magnetic charge. So you've got to think of these, these needles as carrying real magnetic flux. And so the, the, the standard magnetostatics of that magnetic problem, it's all riding on the back of this emergent field. So the emergent field has riding on the back of it real magnetic flux. And so this is real magnetic charge and these objects then will interact with a real uh, Coulomb interaction. Um, and so you can see that if you start off here with two in, two out everywhere, and you flip this spin, for example, so you now you have a pair of three in, one out, and three out, one in, um, uh, separated by a nearest neighbor, okay? Now I can flip a second spin, I can flip uh, this spin, I re-establish the ice rules two in, two out on this tetrahedron, and I move the magnetic mo monopole uh, from here to here, okay? So in the absence of dipole interactions or in this nearest neighbor model, there's no energetic interaction between these topological defects, but because there's real magnetic flux, then you have this real Coulomb interaction between uh, these uh, quasi-particles excitations. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, th this then, it opens the door to both uh, uh, Coulomb, that is quasi-particle, and field theoretic descriptions of spin ice. So what I'm going to try and do now is discuss both the energetics in which I'm going to treat this Hamiltonian as essentially a Hamiltonian of Coulomb interactions between monopoles above this uh, set of equivalent ground states. Okay, so the number of monopoles, as you can see here, this is not conserved. Yeah, I can create and destroy monopoles. So there's a chemical potential for the creation and the destruction of monopoles and a chemical potential for the creation and destruction of double monopoles. Okay, and I can calculate this by going back to my dipolar spin ice and this chemical potential is some function of the exchange part and the magnetic moment and the dipolar interaction. So I can calculate these things. And also because there's a constraint there, the chemical potential, the chemical potential goes like Q squared. The chemical potential of the double monopoles is exactly four times the chemical potential of the single monopoles. And that'll be an important uh, point as I, as I go through. So this will al allow us to attack energetics like uh, specific heat uh, uh, in this low temperature phase, uh, the uh, apparition of phase transitions as you change the value of the chemical potential. And then I want to switch to a lattice field description to, uh, to enable us to get a hand on the spin correlation. Some of this we've already seen because we've already seen these uh, pinch point uh, 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 patterns. Okay, so as we'll see this, this needle, it will uh, represent an element of a lattice field. 
And each needle, it'll be a strength M over A, where M is the magnetic, mag magnetic moment, and A is the distance between sites. Uh, just Peter, just uh, yes. you said this. So the, the the cost of creating one of these monopoles is what a few Kelvin. Uh, yes, so uh, it, it's a few Kelvin. So the exchange, so the energetics, both the energetics and the chemical potential are a few Kelvin. So two uh, uh, two or three Kelvin uh, uh, in each case. Okay, and that's going to be important in what follows. And, the and yes, you said the typical interaction energy of two monopoles at one lattice spacing is also. Yeah, that's right. Order. That's right. Okay. So you can see this. This is uh, so this is specific heat data for homium and dysposium titanate. So the, the blue crosses are experimental data. OK, and you can see that there's a Schottky peak and it's around two Kelvin. So this corresponds, this is exactly the, 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 the temperature where you go from a high temperature, high density fluid to a low temperature, low density uh, uh, fluid. Okay, and so um, here I've got experiment, I've got numerical simulation of the dumbbell model, which only has Coulomb interactions, and I've got uh, the by Huckel theory. And so uh, this is our best shot. There are no fitting parameters here. And so you can see that first of all, the experimental data is extremely well represented by simulations of this dumbbell model with only, uh, Coulomb, inter with only Coulomb interactions and this chemical, chemical potential cost. And then given this model, I can make an improved mean, the mean field theory like the by Huckel theory, and I can get an excellent description of this data. So you, you might ask actually, if you start off with dipolar spin ice, if it gives an excellent numerical description of everything, wh why bother uh, doing all this monopole business? But this dipolar spin ice, that anybody who's worked on dipoles will confirm that they're messy, doing, doing analytical calculations is, is extremely complex. And this allows you to separate, uh, to give you some fractionalization that allows you to identify quasi-particles and make simple theory. So here you have simulation, experiment, and theory together. So give you some idea of how successful that is. Another idea of how successful one, uh, uh, this Coulomb interaction description is of this dipolar model Here's some numerical data of uh, uh, a phase diagram. So that you should concentrate here on the gray. So this is simulations of dipolar spin ice, Hamiltonian. And here you've got varying this ratio of exchange to dipolar interactions. And you've got monopole fluid, which is like spin ice, where it's predominantly two in, two out. And you've got a phase here there's a phase transition, first order phase transition to an all in all out phase where spins are pointing all in or all out on uh, uh, alternative tetrahedra. So now actually going to your question, the system moves here from a, a predominantly ferromagnetic fluid to a predominantly antiferromagnetic uh, uh, or ordered magnetic system. And these are where experimental systems sit on this uh, uh, phase diagram. OK, but I can model this because I have Coulomb interaction. So if I look at the zero temperature ground state energy of my uh, system, you remember that I've uh, written, uh, I can write, uh, I've written the Hamiltonian as essentially uh, the Coulomb energy plus the chemical potential cost of creating these particles. And uh, if I change the ground state uh, configuration, it corresponds to a change of sign of the Coulomb energy uh, minus the, the energy cost of creating the monopole. So this is the Coulomb energy gain of having monopoles, and this is the energy cost of creating them. In this phase, this is a positive number. Um, in this phase, this is, a, this is greater than zero. So at zero temperature, the system doesn't want to have any monopoles. When it changes sign, 
at low temperature. It wants to have as many monopoles as it can. That is a monopole, a, a double monopole uh, uh, crystal. And the ionic energy of this crystal, I can calculate it. If I can remember from my condensed matter physics courses, um, there's something called the Madelon constant, this, ener this ionic energy of the crystal. This is the nearest neighbor energy, uh, the energy of a nearest neighbor pair times this Madelon constant, okay? So then when the chemical potential, if I vary the chemical potential, to go below this threshold across this barrier. And I'll go from a monopole fluid, which is a monopole vacuum at zero temperature to a monopole crystal. Okay, and this monopole crystal will be exactly the zinc blend structure with positive charge and negative charge alternatively on the, ice, on the, on the interpenetrating uh, uh, sublattices of the diamond lattice, so, so north poles and south poles. I'm sorry, I'm not sure it's important, but where is this first order transition to the monopole crystal on the orbit diagram? It's here. It's here. So, so this, th this is dipolar simulation. So this yeah. is varying these parameters. And this corresponds in the monopole language to changing the chemical potential. I so see. as I move along this axis, this axis, I change the chemical potential. Okay. Okay. And uh, you should uh, bear in mind that I'm a stickler for tradition. Okay, so traditionally there's a minus sign here. So that means that if it costs energy to create particles, the chemical potential is negative. So there's a double minus sign, and this is an energy cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So what's, the vertical, what's the vertical axis of that diagram? Is important? Okay, this is temperature. This is, uh, this is temperature, essentially. This is temperature, okay. Okay, so, this so, is, so you could think this as, as temp temperature and chemical potential. Okay. okay, and and I can and this is the threshold. Okay. So now, if I translate this Coulomb language into dipolar spin ice language, I get this value for this parameter here, point, minus 0.918, and it's almost exactly where dipolar spin ice, where this phase transition occurs. Okay, so I mean. If you believe the first bit, then this shouldn't be a surprise. It's just telling you that this dipolar spin ice model, it can be approximated to a, to a really excellent approximation by the Coulomb interactions of these induced monopoles. And here you go from a, a monopole vacuum to this monopole double crystal. Can I, can I ask a question? Yes, please. So in your previous slide, I guess you're talking about the quantum critical point, and that's why there's no entropic contribution to the free energy here. Ah, okay, 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 okay. Uh, um, there's no quantum mechanics. There's no quantum mechanics for the uh, moment. Zero temperature critical point then. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, okay. So somewhere, this is a logarithmic scale. Okay, so uh, uh, going down here, there'll eventually log, there'll eventually be some quantum mechanics and loss of ergodicity kicking in. I mean, it's a very good question that, that's related to the end of my seminar. So here you should think, you should try and force yourself to continue thinking classically here, even though it's at low temperature, okay? But I would remind you that I started off about talking about these Gauke and Stout experiments on ice, Okay, so the proton degrees of freedom in ice, they never freeze and they never become quantum mechanical experimentally. Okay, so no, this Peter, is I rather... think the question was more simple minded than that. I, the question well, was that why are you discussing stability of phases in terms of the energy and not free energy? That's all. Okay, okay, so all, all right, so think classical statistical mechanics then. You have a classical system. Um, you have a classical system and you ask what's its energy at t equals at, at zero temperature, okay? And uh, so in, in this phase, it's a monopole vacuum. And in this phase, it's a double monopole crystal, okay? Mm -hmm. And the condition uh, for changing, it's when you gain energy by having monopoles, okay? As I saw at the beginning, as I showed, tried to show at the beginning, 
the Coulomb energy of a correlated charge neutral system is always negative. But this energy cost, this is a big number. So this is bigger than this. And so the sure. system, it doesn't want any monopoles. Here so normally, the, I would expect a, a minus TS, right? There as well. Yeah, mono, normally, you would, normally you would expect a minus TS. And if we were here for a week, I could discuss that. But uh, oh, that's what you see in Kostelit status, for example. It's, it's exactly that, the change of that factor. And here you that, see, so you say temperature is too small, the entropy TS that, is That's too right. Small this to this is meaningful. a purely, this is an energy, energy phase transition. Okay. okay, and and exactly, actually, it's a good question because there's a tr there's a multi-critical point here. This is the first right. order transition, and this is a second order transition. And across this second order line, entropy is playing a big role. And across okay. the first order line, it's been, it's playing a much smaller role. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, um, I don't know how I'm doing for time here. Yeah, I've used lots of time already. So. Um, um, well, Peter, don't worry. We would like to uh, understand your story. So okay, okay. So let me let me talk uh, let me talk uh, uh, a little bit more. So this double monocle crystal it's also degenerate with a single monopole crystal. Instead of having all in, uh, all in all out, I could have been had three in one out, three out one in. I could have played the same game with single monopoles rather than double monopoles. And as I said, there's a degeneracy. So you have the same condition here for single monopole crystal, and it's the same constraint, okay? And so uh, actually this point here, it is a multi-phase region where there's a double and single monopoles, they're equally, equally probable. When you move away, it's the double monopole that wins, but you could also have a single monopole. And in fact, I'm going to probably going to blow myself away with too many, many details, but um, this system has an incredibly rich phase diagram. This is temperature, chemical potential, and now I can add a staggered field, a staggered chemical potential that's conjugate to this crystalline order parameter. And on this phase diagram, I've got the double monopole crystal, I've got the spin ice phase, but I've also got these wings of single monopole crystal, okay? And these are planes of first order transitions. This is a line of second order transition, and uh, this is a multi-critical point. And any classic people in the audience, they'll uh, um, recognize this is very similar to a S equal to Bloom-Capel model. Uh, where there are multi-stage ordering. It can go from so uh, zero, uh, zero monopoles, single charge crystal, double charge crystal. Okay, and, and all that uh, can be confirmed with, ex with, with numerical simulation. And so maybe I should move on from energetics and try and talk a little bit about spin correlations in terms of um, this lattice field picture. So um, this Coulomb fluid, it satisfies the magnetic Gauss's law. That is that there's no, uh, there's no revolution. These objects carry induced magnetic charge, but Maxwell's equation divergence B equal to zero, it's still valid. Okay, so this, when you have magnetic, in the absence of magnetic monopoles, divergence M would be equal to zero. In the presence of magnetic monopoles, divergence of B is equal to zero. So divergence of M is equal to divergence of H, the magnetic intensity, which is equal to minus rho, this density of magnetic charge. Okay, so. Uh, that's uh, standard electromagnetostatics, actually. But now let me uh, apply it to my emergent system. So rather than, um, rather than the differential form of Gauss's law, I need to think about the integral form of Gauss's law. So let me take a tetrahedron and I integrate over a surface containing four needles. Okay, so this is the theoretical construction. All the magnetic flux is contained in infinitesimally cross sections 
of the needles. Okay, so this integral, it's really just the sum over the magnet magnetization density inside the four needles. Okay, so then this shows you how these, mag how these needles, they become elements of a, of a lattice field, okay, Mij. So this is magnetization density uh, times this infinitesimal cross section that's area that's that's so this is magnetic moment per volume times an area so this gives an object that has units of m over a it has exactly the units of charge and it's a lattice field element okay so this element that has three spins in and three spins out this corresponds to a vertex a set of four elements that are m over e, a with three times minus one and one. Okay, so now I have a sum over j, which is just the, 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 integra the discrete integral. Uh, it gives me sum over j of m i j. That's four, that's three times minus one plus one. This is minus Q, where Q is equal to 2M over A. This is exactly what I told you when I introduced um, uh, the dumbbell mod. Okay, so all this means then that I can do lattice field theory for this object, um, where these are, the la these are the lattice field elements. And uh, the, the, in the presence of magnetic, monopole, of magnetic monopoles, these, magnet, these magnetic field elements, they're going to fractionalize into two fluids. This is what we've called magnetic moment fragmentation. And uh, the, there's an interaction between these two fluids uh, because for each element, each one of these field elements, it has fixed amplitude M over A. So let me give you an example. We started talking about configurations that have two in, two out, okay? Divergence free. So this means the set Mij, uh, it has two in, two out. This is entirely divergence free, what I've called M root, okay? But if I take an element that has three in, one out, here's the three in, one out, I can cut this into two parts. One, it has four times minus a half, this gives me minus two, this is the charge. And the second part, which is minus a half, minus a half, minus a half, plus three halves. And this has divergence zero, and this is a divergence free part, okay? So this is a sleight of hand. This is the theoretician hiding things onto the table. It's not like the magnetic moments really fractionalize into two fluids. They just appear to fractionalize. Okay, and if I go to a, a double monopole, that's all in. Okay, so the all in, they'll have four terms that are part of this, uh, what I call the EC, now it's MM that gives me the magnetic monopoles. Okay, so this cutting into this uh, description in terms of lattice fields allows me to predict that the, the ensemble of magnetic moments can be written in terms of a lattice field with a part that comes from a scalar potential, giving me the magnetic monopoles, and a part that comes from a vector potential. And this is bound to be there because each element is a fixed length. So this is like the leftover once I've paid the price of having these magnetic monopoles. Okay, let me give you a simple example. Or what it tried to be a simple example. Take two plus charges next to each other, nearest neighbors. So these both have three spins in and one out. So here's the out spin and here's the out spin. And I can separate this in this representation. This is like an old fashioned Michelin map. The number of chevrons gives you the strength of the field. So one chevron is M over two A. So one chevron is like a half here. Okay, so this is the uh, three well, in one out, three yeah. in one out. Yeah. And, and this splits into a longitudinal part, giving me the two monopoles, 
chewing uh, uh, charge and a leftover that's divergence free. What is the intuitive reason why this uh, pure gradient corresponds to all arrows point pointing in? This is something that I didn't don't, didn't get. Well, I I I I I don't know. If I go right back to the beginning, sorry, I don't know how to do this. Um, I mean, that's what it looks like, isn't it? That's a charge. Okay, so you look at the field ish emanating from this charge. And it's emanating, and it's it's homogeneously uh, flowing out of the of the of the uh, of the of the um, uh, this of the um, uh, singularity. Okay. Okay. So 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 now, this is the lattice version. Sorry, I've come so far. This is the lattice version of this. Okay, you've got a tetrahedron. The tetrahedron has a, considering it's discrete, it has a very high uh, symmetry. And so you expect the lattice field elements coming out of this monopole to be home, to be distributed in some iso, discrete is isotropic manner. And that's this. Okay. So you can cut this into this plus this, and this is this plus this. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. And so you can do this. And uh, so you can do that actually for any monopole fluid configuration, although it's rather involved and messy, okay? Because it involves solving Laplace's equation for finding what um, M is at each site and then subtracting it from the, the total configuration to give you M root. And that's complicated and I'm not gonna discuss that here. But there's one case where it's, it can be done trivially. And even though it can be done trivially, it's very interesting. So let me go to this single monopole crystal, this crystal of alternate sites of three in, one out, and three out, one in, okay? So this has both charge ordering and residual entropy. If you look at this figure, if I flip the spins around this loop, okay, then I'll still satisfy uh, three in, one out, three out, one in on alternate sites. And the red spin is the minority spin. Okay, so if I flip the minority spin, I'll jump from here to here, uh, from here to here, from here to here, if I go around here. So you can see there's an extensive entropy, even though there's this magnetic order of the crystal. Okay, and so uh, you can do this. You're a th we are theoreticians, so we can choose any value of the chemical potentials, and we can force the system to be in this monopole crystal. Okay, and so this is what we did in, the, in this paper. And so alternate sites have, have uh, three in, one out, three out, one in. If I uh, scatter numerical neutrons off the numerical spin configurations, then I find Bragg peaks corresponding to all in, all out. But those Bragg peaks are, uh, contain exactly a quarter of the total intensity. That is, that they uh, contain exactly a half of the spectral weight. And if I zoom in from the Bragg peaks, to uh, look at diffuse scattering, I see down there a whole scattering pattern of diffuse scattering that looks like the pinch point pattern that I had for um, the two in two out configuration. So this is a mixed state. It has antiferromagnetic order described by the monopole crystal, and it has Coulomb phase ferromagnetic correlations that correspond to uh, the uh, circulation of loops like this. So this is a superposition of a loop model and a long range ordered model. And maybe there's too much information here, but actually, if anybody is interested in hardcore dimers over the last 15 years, there's been an incredible amount of work on high, hardcore dimers. So if you put hardcore dimers onto a diamond lattice, you find that these, the, just the hard cores give you dipole-like correlations. And you can map this dimer configuration onto an emergent field. So you can see, you can say there's a field of one along the dimer and a field of minus one over Z minus one between dimers, okay? And you can see that this pattern here corresponds exactly to this fragmented part here. So actually you've got, um, long range ordered part, 
and a failed part that moves ex that maps exactly onto the face space of hardcore dimers on a diamond lattice. Uh, so, sorry, uh, Peter, I'm confused. Before things were happening in 3G and now dimers are in 2G. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I, I was too stupid to I was too stupid to represent these in three dimensions. So this is just an example for a square lattice. Excuse me, that was not very clear. So this is an example of dimers on square lattice with emergent field. Ah, but if one can put, do dimers on this diamond lattice. If you, if, if you put dimers on the diamond lattice. Yeah. You get the same emergent field, and it's this emergent field. Okay. Okay. okay so the correlations of this emergent field are the correlations of dimers on a diamond on a diamond lattice. Okay. So I've been speaking for a long time. So maybe uh, maybe maybe uh, you should tell me when to wrap up. I can I can jump some stuff here, but uh, I I could say I could jump very quickly the experiments maybe because until now. This has been just a set of theoreticians having fun, right? But as we were doing this, like a present from heaven, uh, my collaborators from Grenoble, they discovered the material, homium iridate. And so homium forms spin ice, and the iridium, it orders antiferromagnetically at a much higher temperature. And it gives you strong internal fields that look exactly like this staggered chemical potential. And miraculously, this system forms an all in all out magnetic order where the magnetic moment is, ex is exactly half the total moment of the iridium ions. Okay, there are no single crystals, but if you look at the diffuse scattering of a powder, uh, then it corresponds to Monte Carlo simulations of these uh, Coulomb phase patterns. So this is exactly a, um, exactly a, 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 a reincarnation of this monopole crystal with uh, fractionalization that I discussed. And then we recently, I've been working with these people on the system material disposing iridate, and we measure actually, uh, we measure this residual dimer entropy at low temperature. Okay. Well, I don't um, know how much? Yeah. How much time? I I can speak for as long as you wish, but I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to. Um, I don't want to. To. to well, maybe to, we should uh, pause for some questions. To, uh, if there are any questions, and then I I mean I, I mean, maybe maybe yeah maybe we can choose make some choice from the things that you yeah. depending also on what the questions are going to be. So yeah, I think yeah, would it be okay with you? Yeah, fine, fine. I should just say that the next chapter was going to be on Dirac strings. I don't know if that's of any interest yeah. to anybody. But... Yeah, so my, I, my question was, it's also like a, 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 maybe a suggestion to one direction of this, what we could choose to, to continue. Is that, okay, you, you talked about this um, uh, M field, but okay, it was never up to now quite clear if there is some regime where this m field could really be maybe at some in some range of temperatures or some range of distances could be imagined as a continuous field if there's some continuous approximation uh, some, uh, yes 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 uh, example, that's something that uh, for me would be interesting to know more about okay maybe other people have other preferences i don't know so people should just speak up I, I should say you, you can make you can make a continuum. Uh, yeah, you can make continuum field theory. Of course, you've got to incorporate these the these constraints, and there are papers on that by Mosner and my collaborators. Um, I've tended to I've tended to concentrate on the discrete uh, on the discrete nature, but. Uh, um, people, people making this uh, this dimer mapping, for example, they go on to discuss continuum descriptions of the di of the of the dimer dimer correlations. So, uh, actually, the identif the identification of this uh, discrete lattice of the this lattice field theory, it's just the first step in a, in a continuum description. I would say. Um, so yes, it can be done. 
So the fact that there are these long range correlations uh, described by this nice formula one over R cube, it means that in fact, at some long distances, you can just use this. That's exactly right. Okay. That's exactly, that's exactly, that's exactly right. And if you, you know, if you look at correlations in this system, they come out to be one over R cubed. And, uh, and, uh, and the, the thing behaves essentially like a continuum system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I don't know, since, since the audience is not giving us any input, maybe, I don't know, how about like, well, you started a bit late because there was a technical glitch. So maybe like I don't know, 10, 15 okay. minutes. Okay, just um, maybe I'll, I'll uh, maybe I shall skip the, this, the, the Dirac strings, but um, you know, Dirac in 1931, uh, proposed that uh, you could create these magnetic particles, monopoles. And as I understand it, he proposed that Maxwell's equation could be saved by, by connecting the charges by an invisible Dirac string. So here's a charge that's radiating flux. Okay. And so if you just take the green part, divergence of B is, is non-zero, but it's, it's, um the, the 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 monopoles are corrected connected by a string that that contains the missing flux so if you take the green flux plus the red flux you get the b equals e equals zero okay so this is not a Dirac system it's not a vacuum these are induced charges and so naturally you have div b is equal to zero but you have something very similar uh, that happens. So if you start off with a reference state, for example, and then you create a pair of monopoles and you separate them by flipping this set of spins. Uh, so this set of spins here is flipped to separate these two. And then you subtract the initial configuration from the final configuration, you get a string. And this is essentially a Dirac string. And I think this is how people in the 1930s thought about uh, electromagnetism. And I, and I think that, uh, the, that Dirac's idea was that a monopole is induced from the vacuum, just as spin ice monopoles are induced from a magnetic medium. Of course, this is completely, uh, completely classic and you have to need to add quantum fluctuations, but it's essentially the same. And, and, uh, and uh, uh, may, may, maybe I'll, I'll skip this, you can see evidence of these strings if you start off from an ordered phase and then from an ordered phase you flip a line of spins and it becomes visible in the background of ordered spins and you can see this with neutron scattering and these these people here Mosner and collaborators they claim to have seen this in this in this scattering experiment my last word would be on quantum fluctuations for nearest neighbor spinites so for the moment it's been completely classical uh, but now what you do is in these models, you allow transfer spin fluctuations. And this means that once you allow these fluctuations, the Hamiltonian is no longer uh, diagonal in SZ, SZ. And so this, these transverse fluctuations allow uh, um, uh, um, uh, dy quantum dynamics of loop flipping. So the low energy sector includes quantum dynamics of loop flipping. And so you introduce uh, quantum fluctuations in the form of loop flipping. And this gives you uh, uh, quantum spin liquid uh, phases. And these quantum spin liquid phases, they can be interpreted essentially as quantum electrodynamics. So what happens now is that if my magnetic field in the absence of monopoles, if my magnetic field could be thought of as the curl of a vector potential, the transverse part gives you a second vector potential that's conjugate to the first, and it's an emergent electric field. So now you build up a ground quantum ground state, which is a coherent superposition of these two in two out states. And there are many different coherent superpositions and uh, so you introduce a band of states from the degenerate Pauling states and the excitation from one superposition to another superposition gives you a photon-like excitation. So the ground state is non-magnetic, it's spin zero, 
but you go from one spin zero state, to, from one state to another by a magnetic excitation, and it looks essentially like a photon. And uh, if you want to read more, I can really recommend this uh, uh, paper by Benton and collaborators. It's not necessarily the first paper on the subject, but it's the most pedagogical, and it's a really t uh, terrific read. Okay, and um, this modifies this, this structure because now instead of having a flat band of states, you have this, uh, 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 this large, this wide, wider band of states. And there's a, there's a hunt for doing experiments on these materials, but finding materials that are experimental examples. Okay, so I should stop. I should say there are two things I didn't talk about. One is dynamics. And we made contact with one of Onsaga's uh, very famous papers from the 1930s on non-ohmic uh, conduction in low density charge fluids, so-called Wien effect. And I didn't talk about Castellane transition, which is a topological transition within the emergent field. That's what uh, my students, one of my students is, is working on. And this is extremely like costless Paulus confinement, deconfinement transition. And uh, so I think I've been speaking for long enough and I'll just leave my conclusions saying that I hope uh, I've given you an insight that this is a garden for emergent physics where you can observe uh, uh, spin fractionalization, Coulomb fluids, Helmholtz decomposition, Dirac strings, quantum electrodynamics, quantum phase transitions, nonlinear dynamics. So bref, essentially everything. So thank you for your attention. Well, th thanks a lot. Let's thank Peter for his very nice talk. And um, well, are there any questions? Can I ask a question? Okay, I probably bombarded you with information, I think. So I'm sorry about that. So let, let me ask you, so, so spin fraction, fra fractionalization so th this means that uh, this was happening when you were taking this um, uh, M and you were decomposing it into pieces. That's right, that's right. Okay, so, you know, all this is just a manipulation of a vector field, right? You can make a, yeah. you can melt, you can make a Helmholtz -like decomposition of any vector field, okay? But, but it turns I, out- You know, in examples of fractionalization that I'm familiar with, uh, where it's uh, related to, quasi-particles and then there are like some quasi-particles you, you can really separate the two things here uh this well i mean it, is it accompanied by the ability to, to separate the the because the, the magnetic the, the quasi-particles here not the quasi-particles the excitations are monopoles and it's not like we can really separate them into two different types of well, I mean, yeah, yes and no. Okay, so this is not spin charge separation, yeah. I guess, but it's something it's something rather similar because uh, uh, you start off with a, with a bunch of, of dipoles and the excitations and monopoles for a start. So it looks like you, the, at the most naive level, you think you've broken the dipole into two monopoles. Okay, but so then the, the field theory, and, and that's a fact. Then the field theoretic consequence of that is that because you've got monopoles, the monopoles are described by a field, and this field decomposes into these two parts. So now if you've got a low density of magnetic charges, right, this part, the monopolar part, it separates essentially completely independently from the circulating dipole apart. The amplitude of the dipole apart is essentially one, is essentially this because the, the amplitude, uh, except for very close to the monopole, the amplitudes here of this part are, are, are very small. So it looks like you've got magnetic, a set of magnetic charge, charges and a set of uh, of magnetic moments. So in that sense, actually, I think it's pretty, it's, it's, it's not uh, dissimilar. Okay. And, and also, and also, you know, often we call these parts transverse and longitudinal, 
because the magic of taking a Fourier transform is that the monopolar part is always parallel to the, uh, the uh, transformation vector Q, and the dipolar part is always perpendicular uh, transverse. So this, this is M of Q longitudinal, and this is M of Q transverse. Okay, so, so uh, uh, these, this set of magnetic moments really looks in reciprocal space like it decomposes into two fluids. So, so I hear what you're saying, but, but actually uh, I, I think it's a pretty spectacular example of fractionalization actually. Okay, are there any other questions? Um, yeah, Joshua. I, I do have a question. Uh, actually, it's on the. Uh, sorry. I, okay. Um, it's on the 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 model uh, the, the the exact model of the um, spin nice model. Um, dipole spin nice model. The, the Hamilton write down it's uh, in terms of interaction between the spins. Uh, this, this this one exactly yeah. this one. Yes. And uh, just after the Dumbled model, you are rewrite it in terms of um, quasi particle, imagine quasi particle. Uh, yeah, so going from here to he here. Exactly, yes. Uh, and um, the, my question uh, is how do you do that? And more pre precisely, why it's not exactly the same um, uh, than it's I should say it's a kind of magic. No, so, um, so, so you, you might, like a skeptic might say that this is just a multiple expansion of this, of this Hamiltonian, okay. Um, but but it, it's more, it, it, it's, it's, it's more subtle than, the, than this. First of all, it relies very heavily on this pyro, pyroclaw uh, symmetry. Right, um, it's it's a fact that on this pyroclaw symmetry, the co the ensemble of two in two out states, they're essentially quasi degenerate, so essentially self screened. So now, if you put this dipolar Hamiltonian on a square lattice, for example, this. Uh, uh, dumbbell model approximation, it's nothing like as good, right? Because if you make if you make a multipole if you make a multipole expansion of this object on the pyroclaw lattice, essentially all you get to an excellent approximation is this. So it's very lattice dependent because this pyroclaw and diamond lattice they're very high symmetry in three dimensions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm not sure that quite uh, 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 an an answers your question. Um, um, but there was also some magic that you wanted to put the dumbbell model so that the, the length of the dumbbells was exactly such that they all converge okay. to the center. That was a bit uh, with sleight of hand. I didn't understand why. Yeah, that's, a, that, that's a sleight of hand. And uh, to, read, to know more about that, then you need to read yeah. uh, some of, of Mosner's papers. So, so what you can do is you start with a point dipole and you replace it by a dumbbell of length x. OK? And then you, you increase it continuously until x is equal to a. Yeah. Right. So when X is equal to A, you have a dumbbell model that only has Coulomb interactions. Yeah. Right. So if you start off with a square lattice and you do that, you change the energetics considerably, extending from when X goes to zero to A. But mm -hmm. on the pyroclaw lattice, it's really small. Okay. There's like a separation of energy scale. And that's because of the cancelling effects specific to the pyroclaw lattice. Okay. okay. This, 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 there's these papers by uh, Mosner and Sondi. There's a paper by Mo Mosner and Sondi called Projective Equivalence. Why, the, why spin ice obeys the ice rules. And essentially, when you do this on a pyroclaw lattice, there's virtually zero change. 
Okay. Uh, but if you do it on a square lattice, there's a huge change. The, 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 dipole, the dipole Hamiltonian on a square lattice and the, and the dumbbell model on a square lattice are completely different. So that was a slight of did, did that help? I don't know if that helped. Yeah. Maybe well, another yes, uh, one, one more thing. I, one more thing I could say for people who are interested in particle physics, you might notice that the inner inside these dipole, these monopoles, there are three little objects. Okay, so a monopole is made up of one blue spot and three red spots. And it's, I think we've we've exploded our time today, but there are lattice symmetries where you can see also the fractionalization of a monopole into smaller objects. That also happens in some, ge some geometries. So the monopole is always the fundamental object for dynamics. Whenever something moves, it's a monopole that moves, but you can observe a fractionalization of those charges. So this is a, an elementary example of, fract of charge fractionalization. Well, actually, I, I, I would like to continue because I have a few other questions, but uh, if Peter, you are available, but maybe I-, I I'm available. Like to, I would like Liberate to stop people. the recording then. Yeah.